Father in heaven, we thank you for this amazing grace that you, that you would give and give and give as you have in your son, that you would give a gift of righteousness through faith alone in your son is staggering in light of what we have become and what we have made of ourselves and what we have done with ourselves together as a human race. So, Father, would you please help us um, with your word this morning to gain fresh insight into the amazing work of Jesus Christ to save sinners like us. Father, I pray for those of us here who are saved by your grace already. Father, may you deepen our understanding and may you draw out of us greater expressions of worship and thankfulness to you, to your son, for what he has done to truly rescue us. Help us to see how bad it really was. Help us to see how much better it really will be that we can't even understand yet fully. And Lord, I pray that you would give special insight in only the way that you can to those who have not trusted you yet, that they might see how bad it is, but how good it can be in Jesus. Lord, we trust your word to speak to these things accurately. You do not lie. The sum of your word is truth, and we are eager to be fed by you now, and we ask this in Christ's name, amen. Let's take our Bibles and let's open them up. If you don't have one, the guys are going to make their way up these two aisles here and just put your hand up in the air. They'll put one in your hand if you'd like to have it. And if you don't have a Bible, you can keep that one. It is yours from us. Romans chapter 5, verse 15 is where we're going to be this morning, 15 to 17. The broader paragraph that we're in is Romans 5, verses 12 to 21. And really, that whole section in Romans 5, 12 to 21 is the gospel tale of two men, Adam and Jesus Christ. And the gospel tale includes the two respective peoples who belong to each of the two men. And this gospel tale of these two men, it includes how interconnected these men are to their respective peoples. Adam has a unity with his people, an almost unbreakable unity. He has solidarity with his people. That's a good word to have in your vocabulary in regards to this. He has solidarity with his people. And Jesus has Unity with his people, and it is an absolutely unbreakable unity. He has solidarity with his people. And this is why the gospel tale that unfolds in Romans 12 and following, or Romans 5, verse 12 and following, says at the end of verse 14 that Adam is a type of him who was to come, meaning Jesus. They both have solidarity with their own respective peoples. But you're going to find out this morning that that is where the solidarities or the similarities end and where the contrasts begin. Because the gospel tale of these two men also includes how each man formed his solidarity with his own people. And this is where the contrast between the men are the strongest, where they are the most striking. How each man formed his bond of unity with his respective people. It's not just different from the other one. It is exactly the opposite of the other one. How Adam formed solidarity with his people, it was so devastating. Do you remember this from last week? It happened through such severe and tragic means. Look at 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death entered into the world of men through sin, and so death spread to all men, there's solidarity with the result that all these dead men sinned. 
how Adam formed solidarity with all of his people was so devastating. Death reigned over all of his people, even if their sin wasn't exactly the same as Adam's one transgression in a sinless garden that started the whole thing. And how Jesus, in stark contrast, forms his solidarity with his people is so super abundant in grace, is the way that Paul says it. It's with such undescribable, undeserved favor and with a gift. And that's what this passage is all about today. Let me read verses 15 to 17 for you. Follow along as I read verse 15. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many, super abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance, the superabundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, they will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So what is this passage all about? It's this. You can see it up on the screen. Three striking contrasts distinguish how Adam and Jesus formed solidarity with their own peoples. And here's the first one, the first striking contrast. It's death versus a gift. Which would you rather have? Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the transgression. That's where Paul starts. The free gift is from Jesus to his people, and the transgression was Adams that started the whole wicked mess that all of his people are in when he transgressed in the garden. And just to remind you, transgression is not a mild term. Adam did not mildly, inadvertently slip a little bit in the garden, but rather his sin was deliberate. It was purposeful, and therefore it was grave. And without excuse, he purposefully crossed over a divinely drawn line and entered into a divinely forbidden land, departing from God's standard. And by that transgression of the one man, verse 15, a horrible solidarity occurred. Verse 15, the many died. You remember the tragic progression in verse 12, right? Through one man, sin entered into the world of men, and then death entered through that sin into the world of men, and so death spread to all men with the result that all of those dead men sin. What Paul is emphasizing here in this gospel tale is how that death dynamic formed solidarity for the human race by the one transgression of the one man, Adam, back in the garden. So how did Adam form solidarity or an unbreakable bond with the human race? He used death to form solidarity with us. The bond, the union between us all with him is, is spiritual deadness to God. Not just physical death, but spiritual deadness to God, which eventually puts us all into a physical grave. Adam employed death to form our unity together with him. And that manner or that way of forming solidarity through spiritual deadness to God is stated as a condition, verse 15. Do you see it? For if by the transgression of the one the many died. Meaning, let's assume this to be true for the sake of argument, and it is true, by the way. Then, much more did, verse 15, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, superabound to the many. 
That's quite a contrast. An excessive contrast in the entirely opposite direction from Adam's solidarity through death. It's excessive in that you see the words much more and superabound. So let's examine how Jesus formed his excessively more abundant, better way of solidarity with his people. Look at verse 15, right in the middle. Much more did the grace of God, that undeserved favor of God, partnered with the gift by the grace of the one man. So you get the grace of God the Father, the grace of the Son, Jesus Christ, and a gift coming from that grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. That gift is freely given by the unmerited favor of him. And that forms our solidarity in Christ. So Adam used death, spiritual deadness to God to get his people. And Jesus used his gracious gift to get his people. Think on how different these two men are from one another. One used death, the other used a gift. What would you think of two men that you personally knew who did that? They're not just sort of different. They're the opposite. One is taking life away and the other is giving. Think on how different the testimony of each group is from the other. One in Adam would say, well, what we are all together with Adam, we are what we are because of death. We're dead to, to God. That's the testimony of the one group if they could see themselves rightly and accept it and say it. And the other group would say, we are what we are together with Jesus because he gave us a gift we don't deserve. Those aren't just kind of two sort of different groups of people. Those are entirely two different groups, opposite from one another. Death unified the one group, and a gift from Jesus Christ unified the other group. To help you understand how grace here superabounds over death, because you might be tempted to, as you read a passage like this, um, think, um, you might be tempted to view them both as equal force, but in opposite directions. And that's not what Paul is saying. He keeps saying much more. And he uses a word that he just makes up, superabounding. So to understand how grace superabounds over death, I want you to consider the baseline where both men had to start from to form their solidarity with their people. Because this is going to show how much greater and how much more powerful and superabundant is grace over death. So we'll start with Adam. He was in a sinless garden paradise. That's easy. He began the formation of his solidarity with his people there. He was given one command, not ten. Not 613, like in Mosaic Law. So that's easy, just one command. But then the easiness of that was twisted and became a nightmare. The easiness spread through his transgression in, in the worst way possible. Death easily spread to all men. The easiness took on a devastating dimension to it. Every single man died to God. Not one man had an opportunity in life to come to the realization that death was outside him, uh, him and then that it wanted to take him over and he, he didn't have the opportunity to fight it off. Before he even realized he was dead, he already was dead to God. It spread that easy into the human race. It just easily happened to each man. The one sinned and mysteriously and easily all men died. And death therefore easily reigned. It's like dropping a rock. It just easily, naturally falls to the ground. And that solidarity, that hardness, cemented together Adam's people by death. So Adam's formation of solidarity began in a garden 
where did Jesus have to begin the formation of his solidarity with his people? Uh, he wasn't in a sinless paradise garden. <laughs> If Jesus was going to form a new people in solidarity with him, the only people to go get were already cemented to one another and Adam in death. That's the only place he can go to get his people. Jesus was going to have to break them free from the concrete death slab of solidarity that we were all in. How easy is that? What kind of power must grace be to do that? I'll give you an illustration again so you can um, really see how almost ridiculous this is. Imagine I give you a box and I command you to go to San Clemente to collect rocks, to get a rock collection. All you gotta do is go to San Clemente and fill your box full of rocks. But when we get there, I don't let you walk the rocky beaches to get your rocks one at a time. Instead, I stop the traffic on I-5. And I put you in the middle of I-5 and I tell you to get all of your rocks for your collection out of the cement freeway. You see, it's infinitely easier to cement the rocks together than it is to break one out at a time, isn't it? And this is what makes the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, so much greater than the solidarity of death that cemented us all together in Adam. The gift is greater than the death that cemented us together in solidarity of death with Adam. This is unrestrained abundance in the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. Do you understand the goodness of Jesus Christ to do that? Do you understand the power of Jesus Christ to go and do that? That he, from absolutely no merit of yours, would deliver you out of your death solidarity with a gift. What kind of a savior is that? He is so good. And he is powerful to be able to do that. What is the gift, by the way, that he gives? He, he doesn't say right here in verse 15, does he? But if you look in verse 16, he says it results in justification. And verse 17 just plainly says it is the gift of righteousness. Turn back to Romans chapter 3, verse 24, so we can tie this back to the section before that we were in. This is not a new thought. This is why he can just say the gift. And this is why he can tie it to grace without having to really explain himself because he already did back here in Romans 3, 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Being declared righteous with a status of righteousness that is God's as a gift by his grace. That is the gift, listen, that breaks you free from the solidarity of death that you have with Adam. It's the only thing. Justification by faith alone is powerful to break the bond of the solidarity of death that we all have in Adam. And that is a striking contrast between how Adam formed solidarity with his people and how Jesus formed solidarity with his people. Adam easily, unfortunately, used death to form his solidarity. Jesus powerfully, graciously used a gift, the gift of justification by faith alone to form his solidarity. The first striking contrast is death versus a gift. The second striking contrast that distinguishes how Adam and Jesus form solidarity with their people is 
condemnation versus justification. Which would you rather have? The contrast between the two men and their methods for forming solidarity is reaffirmed in verse 16. Look at it. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. Well, in what way? Well, on Adam's side, on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. Sounds like a courtroom. One transgression, that's the one in the garden that Adam committed against the command God gave him. Judgment came down from the judge resulting in condemnation for us all. So how did Adam form solidarity with his people? With and through condemnation. We have a concrete slab of solidarity of condemnation that cements us all together with Adam. An unbreakable bond, it seems, of condemnation. But what about Jesus? How is he different from Adam? How did he form solidarity with his people? Verse 16, halfway through. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. That is just not what I expected. The free gift... It arose from not one transgression like Adam's judgment did. What is so great here, it is a free gift. We did not have to try to clean up our transgressions first. We simply had to just receive the free gift through the, though there were many transgressions abounding throughout all of our lives in the solidarity of condemnation. Jesus doesn't come and stand over the slab of humanity and say, stop the transgressing. And when you do, I'll act. It reminds me of Romans 4, 5, remember? But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the what? The ungodly. His faith is credited as righteousness. Look, you are ungodly. He comes to the slab of ungodliness. He comes to the slab of transgression and death and condemnation. And he says, I have a gift for you. It's a free gift. How can this be? Adam committed one transgression. And out of that one transgression came judgment from the judge resulting in condemnation. We all commit not just one transgression, but according to verse 16, many transgressions. How's God going to respond to the many? If that's what he did with the one transgression, what's he going to do with the many? And this is where it is absolutely unexpected, is it not? He comes with a free gift? Who is this? Unto what? A free gift resulting in justification? A free gift came where there was many transgressions, which meant we were all declared righteous in justification if we receive his free gift. So Jesus formed solidarity with his people, not with more condemnation, he would have been right to do that because we had more transgressions. Rather, he formed solidarity with us with justification in the free gift that he gave to us. So one group is under a sentence of condemnation and they are cemented together in that with Adam and the other group is under a declaration of righteousness and they are all cemented together to Jesus Christ in that. How kind of Jesus and how utterly unexpected that Jesus would do that. How gracious of him to do this. And again, I want you to think about where Jesus had to go to form his solidarity. Where he had to start. He didn't go to a sinless garden paradise and start there, but he went to death row. He went to death row. 
And there we all were cemented to one another in Adam, in condemnation. And if Jesus is going to form a new people, he'll have to break the bond of condemnation that we are all bound under. How did he do that? By taking on himself our condemnation at his one death at the cross. And upon doing so, we could no longer be held in the bond of condemnation with each other in Adam any longer because he was condemned in our place, the ones who receive his gift. And upon receiving the free gift of justification, God no longer sees over us a sentence of condemnation, but instead he sees his own righteousness declared over us as a gift. So how much greater is Jesus than Adam. He had to start with much, much worse conditions than Adam ever did to form his solidarity. And he had to undo such a slab of solidarity of death and condemnation in order to even begin a new collection of rocks or people. Adam formed solidarity through condemnation. Jesus, in striking contrast, formed solidarity with his people through justification. That's just, that's not just different. That's the opposite. The third striking contrast that distinguishes how Adam formed solidarity with his people from how Jesus formed solidarity with his people is, number three, enslaving versus reigning. Would you rather be enslaved or would you rather reign? These are no-brainers, aren't they, when you're thinking rightly? This last contrast comes in the form of an explanation. Do you see it in verse 17? Four. That means an explanation is coming. And it's really an explanation of the prior argument in verses 15 and 16. And it also comes in the form of a condition. But let's hold that off for a moment, and let's just look first at the simple statement, and then we'll come back to the conditional aspect of it. Notice Adam's side first in verse 17. By the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. The one there is Adam. We know death reigned over us all. Verse 12, death spread to all men. And death reigned, verse 14. Even if we didn't sin exactly in the same way that Adam did in the garden. Death enslaved us. We all in Adam were slaving under spiritual deadness to God that eventually will also put every single one of us into a physical grave. And that's how Adam formed solidarity with his people, enslaving them under death. Spiritual deadness to God. And that is what is stated in the form of a condition. If this is assumed to be true for the sake of the argument, and by the way, it is true, then how much more this that is coming? How is Jesus different? How is the way he forms solidarity with his people different? Then, verse 17, much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Now, we need to unpack that very long sentence, and we're going to do it this simple way first. The subject is those. Those. And the main verb is will reign. Those, dot, 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 will reign. And then one more detail. In life, which is the opposite of the death that we were in, those will reign in death. That's quite a contrast from what was just said about how Adam formed solidarity with his people. Death reigned over us all though the, through the one man and his one transgression, enslaving us under death that solidified us all together with Adam. But the gospel tale of Jesus doesn't say, doesn't go from, watch this, it doesn't say death reigned, but don't worry, it's, what's even better is now life reigns. He didn't say that. Did you notice that? Look down again. What's the subject? Those will reign. We were in shackles as slaves under death's reign, but instead, through Christ, we will wear a crown and reign. 
we will reign through him in life. And that is the mark of our solidarity with Jesus. Listen, that's not a different way of going about forming solidarity than the way Adam did. That's completely the opposite. Well, who are the those? Look back at verse 17. Those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Those are the ones who will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. The idea is that as we were once in a cement slab of slavery under the reign of death, Jesus didn't come and demand that we break ourselves free. And Jesus did not come with a small dose of, in a dropper of his grace in a dropper and drop it on us to break us free from the slavery we were in. But what we found in that slab of being enslaved is we found a waterfall amount of grace, an abundance of it, a super abundance of it. It's an excessive, unrestrained abundance that we found God's grace to be. And in particular, regarding his gift of righteousness that he declared over us that we received in the gift by his grace through faith alone. So, if for the sake of the argument, we assume as true Adam's solidarity with his people through enslaving them under death's reign, and that is true, then much more will the ones in the slab of slavery who receive Jesus' grace gift of righteousness, how much more will they find new solidarity that is marked by future reigning in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? How certain was it that you were enslaved? That's certain. It's a fact. It's an undisputed fact, believer. Do you know what is more certain than that? How can you get more certain than that? Well, Paul says, more certain than that is the fact that one day, through Christ, you will reign in life. And that's the mark of our solidarity with him. Can you even believe that? Do you have a capacity to even get your head around that? You notice it's a future tense. Those will reign in life. It, it is a future reality. It is a future promise that is not even here yet, but it is spoken of as much more certain than a historical fact. It's already occurred for the believer. You were enslaved. You were enslaved under the reign of death. This will certainly occur in the future. Shackles tossed aside, certainly for a crown and a throne one day. Like Joseph went from slaving under Potiphar and slaving in a prison to sitting on the throne of Pharaoh. So too you, even more so. I want to have you turn to Colossians 3 for a moment. This is not a parallel passage, but I think this might be helpful in one sense. I, Colossians 3, 1 to 4. I want you to just think about this. Maybe it'll help you grasp that there is this certain promise about you reigning in life through Christ, but it's not now. I want you to notice this. Therefore, Colossians 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That acknowledges our union with Christ in his resurrection, right? And so if you have been raised up with Christ, then keep seeking the things above where he is. You see, he's your focal point. He's your magnet. He's your lodestone. You, you're, now if you've been raised up with him, you've been given a whole new dimension to look at. You're not in that slab of of death and condemnation and slavery anymore. You're, you've got a new direction that's been given to you. Keep setting your mind there, verse 2. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Why? Because you have died. And that, there's your union with Christ in his crucifixion and in his burial. You have died. What you were in that slab is dead 
and gone. The old things have passed away. You can never go back to that. You can never be in solidarity with Adam, with all of his people again. Oh, will you sin and be stupid like me? Yes, every day. And it's really sad. But you can never go back to that. For you have died. Now watch this. Your life is what? Hidden. It's hidden with Christ in God. That's a pretty good hiding place. So you're told that you have life, but you cannot know all of it yet at this point, which is the point of verse four. When Christ, who is our life, so wait a minute, is our life with Christ or is Christ our life? And the answer is, yep. When he is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So if your life is hidden in him and you don't know every aspect and every detail of what your life actually is now with Christ, he's going to be revealed one day and now then you will finally know what you are. How on earth does that apply or even connect with Romans 5? You've been told in Romans 5 that you will reign in life. And listen, you don't get all of what that means, but when he comes, your life, which includes you reigning through him in life, it'll be revealed then, and you'll see it, and you'll know it. It's coming. It is certain. It is more certain than your former slavery under death with Adam and everybody else. How excessively good is Jesus Christ? How excessively gracious and powerful is Jesus Christ over and above Adam? Listen, his his solidarity with his people, it can be broken. It can be, but only by one man and by grace, by his gift. Adam's solidarity with his people can be broken, and many of you sitting here this morning are evidence of that power. But nothing, no one, can break the concrete slab of love that we are in because of Jesus. I want you to go to Romans 8. I'm just going to read this. I want you to see this. Again, we'll be in Romans 8 in a couple years, so hang on. Romans 8, that's not true. Verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? And we could just wait for somebody to come up with a list, but we don't need to, because God is the one who justifies. Did he justify you or not? Did he declare you righteous on the basis of faith alone or not? Who is the one who condemns? Come with any list you want. You don't need to worry, because Christ Jesus is he who died in your place under that condemnation. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from this new solidarity we have, this slab of love? Who will separate you from the love of Christ? Will will tribulation do it? Will distress break you free? Will persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? I know it seems like it's just like it's written. For your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Life is not easy, but your solidarity in that love of Christ is unshakable. But in all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. He doesn't say we will overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Right now, we are overwhelmingly conquering through him who loved us. There's a little bit of reigning going on even right now. We're conquering. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other creative thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, nothing can put you, take you out of the slab of Christ and put you back into the slab of Adam. Nothing, no one, ever How excessively good and gracious is Jesus Christ?
how much excessively better and more powerful is his manner of forming solidarity over Adam's way of forming solidarity. How he formed his solidarity with his people is a striking contrast to how Adam formed solidarity with his people. Adam used death over us all to make us his. Death spread into all of us to form solidarity with him, but Jesus went into that concrete slab of death with his grace gift, and he broke apart that concrete slab of death, and one by one, he delivered us out into a new, better, unbreakable solidarity with him through the grace gift that he gave I want to ask you a question. Do you understand that the gospel says your biggest problem before God is your spiritual deadness to him? Listen, you don't need to be saved from unfulfilled dreams and plans. You need to be delivered from your unfeeling heart towards God, your thoughtlessness toward God, your uncaring heart toward God, your unconcerned mind toward God, your unresponsiveness to him, you are dead and deadness rules you and it will put you in the grave one day and eternal death comes after that. And do you understand that you're not merely a, a pebble out there unconnected from other pebbles and Christ just needs to pick you up out of your own deadness to God? Do you understand that's not the case here in Romans 5? But do you understand that in order to save you, he must overcome not just your own personal deadness to him, but he must break the bond of spiritual deadness that is over all of us but is applied to you. And Jesus does that by his gift of righteousness that comes by faith. And he doesn't save you from solidarity in Adam to set you free into a solitary life on your own. He saves you from solidarity into solidarity, from one people to the next people. And on earth, that people that are his express themselves in local gatherings called local churches. You cannot be on your own if you claim to be in Christ. And Adam used condemnation over us all from, to form solidarity with his people. But Jesus went into the concrete slab of condemnation, and with justification by faith alone, he broke that concrete slab of condemnation, and one by one, he delivered us out with justification, and he formed his solidarity with his people. So do you understand that the gospel says your other biggest problem, how can you have more than one biggest problem? I don't know, but you do. According to the gospel, we all do. Your other biggest problem before God is the sentence of condemnation that hangs over your head that he put there, that God put there. And what you need most that you don't have yourself is what he, God, is willing to give, a declaration of righteousness over your life even though you have only ever been condemned and dead as a sinner and he gives it by faith in Jesus. But do you also understand that in order to save you, he must overcome not just your own personal sentence of condemnation over you, but that he must overcome that larger binding sentence of condemnation that solidifies you into the rest of condemned humanity. What kind of power does that take? It's not just personal individual salvation that happens to you, praise God it is. But you need to understand what he's done. And Jesus does that. He overcomes that solidarity of condemnation through a declaration of righteousness that comes by faith alone in Christ alone. And he doesn't set you free from a doomed solidarity to wander away into a life of solitary wanderings. But you go from solidarity to solidarity. If he saves you, you come and be a part of his people. And Adam used slavery enslaving us to form solidarity with us. But Jesus went into that concrete slab of slavery and by our future reigning through him, he formed solidarity. He broke apart the concrete slab of slavery and one by one he delivered sinners from their shackles so that one day they will indeed wear a crown through him in life if, if they receive his son's gift. But do you understand 
that the gospel says this is also your third biggest problem, <laughs> that you're slaving away under death. What you need most is to be set freed from slaving. But do you understand that you're not merely a pebble out there disconnected from the others? And that Christ doesn't just need to pick you out of your own personal slavery, but do you understand that in order to save you, get your mind around this, he must overcome not just your own shackles, but he must break how your slavery is cemented into a bigger slavery that humanity is in under Adam. And Jesus does it. And when he does it by his gift, a new solidarity with his people comes and you will wear a crown through him in life and reign. And he does it from one solidarity to the next. I, I wanna ask you, what do you think you can do about your own spiritual deadness? What do you think you can do about your own sentence of condemnation? What do you think you can do about your own slavery under death? If Romans 5 says anything, it tells you that those things are much worse than you could possibly know. Listen, you can't break any of those as they dominate you personally. You can't break uh, spiritual deadness that's your own. You can't break your own sentence of condemnation. You can't stop your own slavery to death any more than you can break. You certainly can't break the bigger solidarity you have with the rest of the human race in death, in condemnation, and in slavery. You have absolutely no power to change yourself. You absolutely have no power to disconnect yourself from humanity. You're powerless. And I want you to consider this. What you must be rescued to, which is a solidarity with Jesus, it is greater than you know. It is far, far beyond your own ability to achieve that. Listen, you don't have the power to get yourself personally back to the garden. By the way, that is not what God is after. He is not working out everything in Jesus Christ just to get humanity back into the garden. That's not far enough. So you don't have the power to get yourself back to the garden paradise where it all started, let alone to get into the actual righteousness of God in Jesus Christ and in life with Christ and reign through him in life. How do you get yourself there? If that's what salvation is, if salvation is that bad, and if salvation is that good and being delivered from the one to the other, what are you going to do? And the answer is nothing in the gospel. Receive the gift. He comes to you, and he says, it's this bad. And he says to you, it can be this good in my gift. Receive what you don't have. Trust me. Trust my son. It has all been done for you. But you must believe Jesus Christ. You must trust Jesus Christ to take on your deadness and win. You must trust Jesus Christ to take on your sentence of condemnation and win. You must trust him to take on your slavery and give you life. Righteousness and a crown. Do you believe this Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you that he did for me what I could never do for myself that he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. Father, I pray that you would open all of our eyes, that we might see a little bit more how devastating our solidarity with Adam is. Oh, Lord, don't let this just be some kind of a theological expression that we think others with bigger minds can hold on to. This is in your Bible for us. Rather, make this 
plain and clear to us. Drive this home into each one of our hearts how bad it was. And then drive into our hearts, each one of us, that we might see how super abounding your grace is. And what we are saved to is so much greater and better than what we could ever imagine or describe. For those of us who believe you, Lord, would you draw out of us the worship that you deserve, the humility that that matches this kind of understanding. Would you redirect our minds as believers in Jesus Christ that we might keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at your right hand? Might you give to us a little bit more a, a longing for his appearing because of what you have given us and what you have promised that is more certain than our former slavery? And Father, open the eyes of the one who is has been blind up to this moment, Lord. Let the scales fall from their eyes like Paul, that they might see the glory of Jesus Christ. Save them, Lord, with your gift that comes by your son's grace. It's in his name we pray.